Okay, this is the second of our videos about surface tension. In the first part, we introduced surface tension. We defined it in terms of the energy or work associated with uh, increasing the interfacial area between two fluids. Uh, so here we're going to take that definition, start with it, and then apply it uh, in a way that can let us look more deeply at the physics and obtain an equation, a relationship called the, the Young-Laplace equation, which is useful uh, for looking at surface tension or capillary effects in fluids. Okay, so again, where the starting point is the definition of surface tension, which is the work or energy associated with a change in interfacial area, an increase in interfacial area. And we're going to apply it to an infinitesimal or a differential area element, dA. And so when we do that, you know, the work or the energy associated with this change is equal to the surface tension coefficient times the differential area, dA. So we can look at the units of this to see that it makes sense, right? Work is uh, units of joules or newtons meters. Uh, surface tension, we said, is units of newtons per meter. And area is units of meters squared. So this equation makes sense uh, dimensionally, which is always good to know. So now we're going to try to apply this uh, to a specific case. So I'm going to look at uh, a, a geometry here. Uh, let's consider uh, a situation where we have the work associated with increasing uh, a surface that we can describe in terms of two different radii of curvature, R1 and R2. This is a generalized curved surface, so let me draw what I'm talking about. So I have two uh, area elements on this curved surface. This green one is the initial area, and the uh, uh, purple one is the expanded one. So you can think of this as a balloon, for example, like it's inflated to some amount, and then we draw a square on the surface with a marker, then if we inflate the balloon a little bit more, the surface area is going to expand uh, to a larger uh, size, to this uh, purple uh, element. So that's what's drawn here. And so I'm talking about how we can express uh, this shape. And I can do that in terms of these two radii of curvature. So R1 represents the curvature of kind of the left and right hand sides of these uh, curved uh, area elements. And R2 represents the curvature associated with the top and bottom sides. Okay, so these two radii of curvature allow me to define uh, the, the, this area element in space on a curved surface. So now I know that I want to represent the, uh, also the geometry. So since this is a differential element, right, I can say that it has some height x and some width y initially. And these two elements are separated by some differential distance dz. So then in the deformed shape, uh, we go from x to a height of x plus dx, and the width increases from y to y plus dy. Okay, so this is the initial state, and then this is the deformed state. So now with these definitions, I can go in and describe the change in area associated with this deformation. So that's just the difference between the final and initial states, and so I know what those are. The initial area is x plus dx times y plus dy, uh, the final area and the initial area is x times y. So these are small shapes, so I can approximate them as just length times width. So then if I go through and multiply through the terms in this first, ter first equation uh, and expand them out, I can see a couple of things. First is that the term, the product xy, cancels out. Uh, so I can cross that out. And then I have this term dx dy. So I'm going to say that I can also neglect that term. Why is that? Well, it's what I'm, I'm calling a second order term. So if we remember that we're talking about differential elements, you know, the length scales dx and dy are already small, right? They're infinitesimally small. So if those terms are already small, then the product between two small numbers is something that's much smaller. So compared to all these other, these other two terms in the equation, the product dx and dy is much smaller. So I can neglect it compared to these other two terms. So that allows me to simplify uh, the expression for the area. So I can plug it back in uh, to our relationship up here. So the work associated with this change in interfacial area is the surface tension coefficient gamma times dA, uh, which is x dy plus y dx. Okay, so let me just rewrite that here on the next slide uh, so that we can refer to it. Now, because we're talking about a differential change, a differential displacement, this uh, work 
associated with this change in interfacial area can be associated with a corresponding change in pressure. And so then I can express the work done uh, as force times displacement. So, and I can map that to this pressure change. So here's what I mean, right? The work associated with this uh, change in interfacial area is equal to force times distance, force times displacement. Force is this pressure, uh, which is force per unit area times area. So I have force times distance uh, associated with this displacement from the initial to the final surface area. So let me draw again. Uh, I'm just reproducing the drawing from the previous slide here. Uh, so that we can refer to it or continue to refer to it uh, as we continue. Okay, so now what we want to do is try to simplify our relationship because we have specifically we have you know dx, dy, and dz. So we'd like to try to reduce the number of variables that we have in the equation. We can do that by comparing the uh, the geometry of these initial and deformed states and noting that they're they're similar. They're geometrically similar. Okay, so let me show you what I'm talking about here. Uh, so I can look at this face uh, of width x on the curved surface, and I can see that that, um, uh, that spans some interior angle here uh, at a radius r1. Then if I look at the corresponding face on the deformed surface uh, of, uh, well, of arc length x plus dx, I notice that that spans the same interior angle. So if you remember from your uh, trigonometry that the angle uh, is equal to uh, the ratio of the arc length to the radius, and so since they both span the same interior angle, the ratio of these arc lengths x and x plus dx to the corresponding radii r1 and on this side r1 plus dz should be the same because they're equivalent, uh, they're geometrically equivalent. So I can write that down uh, here, x plus dx, uh, write the, the width of this face over the radius, uh, should, the ratio of those two quantities should be the same as x over r1 because, and the reason being that they uh, span the same interior angle. So then with that I can solve for dx, uh, so I get dx is x over r1 times r1 plus dz minus x. So now if I multiply through uh, all these terms, so I have x times r1 over r1, which is just 1, plus x times dz over r1 minus x. So the x's cancel, and then I get finally an expression for dx in terms of dz. So, uh, you know, I did that with the face uh, here uh, that correspond to the radius of curvature r1, so you could imagine that similarly I can do the same analysis on the other faces that correspond to the radius of curvature r2 and I arrive at a corresponding relationship that expresses dy in terms of dz. So now I can return to the expression for the work um, in terms of the surface tension uh, and the uh, pressure times displacement, and I can now substitute in for uh, the corresponding terms in the area, right? So the, uh, the change in area we saw was x dy plus y dx, so then I can substitute in directly uh, from the expressions that I found uh, from geometry that express dy and dx in terms of dz. And so then this will allow me to simplify this equation further. Okay, so let me uh, again just rewrite that here at the top of this slide. Okay, so if I solve for delta p, then I can substitute for dy and dx uh, in terms of the relationships that we derived on the previous slide in terms of dz uh, divided by xy dz. And then if I multiply through, right, I have xy dz times 1 over r2 plus xy dz times 1 over r1 over xy dz. So notice that each of these terms has the quantity xy dz in common. So this will cancel out. And so when I do this, I get a much simpler equation. I get that the pressure associated, a pressure drop across the interface is related to the surface tension plus the sum of the inverse of the radii of curvature. So this is the Young-Laplace equation. And it comes basically just from a geometric argument associated with looking at the change in the surface area of this interface. For a sphere, so we looked uh, before at a uh, general curve shape that could be expressed in, two, in terms of two 
independent radius of radii of curvature. Uh, for a spherical drop, if the, the shape is a sphere, then there's one radius of curvature. So R1 equals R2, and the equation simplifies here. So this is the, the form of the Young-Laplace equation for a sphere. So the thing, one of the things to notice here is that when there's an inverse proportionality to the radius R. So as we get to small drops, uh, or small radii of curvature, this pressure drop across the interface becomes very large. And so for that reason, uh, these surface tension forces, again, like we said in the last slide, become important, very important at smaller and smaller length scales. So very small drops, you know, less than, you know, one, uh, a micron uh, or so are very, are extremely unstable uh, for this reason.